In this video, I am going to start bringing in some new ideas here that we haven't talked about yet in this organic chemistry playlist. And this is the ideas that come from molecular orbital theory. And that's so we can talk about conjugated systems. So I do have an entire playlist that's about molecular orbital theory. So if you're interested in that, you can check out that playlist. But this is going to be just a very quick crash course on the amount of molecular orbital theory that we will need to understand in order to do this organic chemistry. And so the first thing we want to talk about when we're talking about conjugated systems is that we are talking about double bonds within the same molecule that can interact if they are separated by just one single bond. So here in this top row we have conjugated systems, so 1,3-butadiene or 1,3-pentadiene or 1,3-hexadiene. And the thing to notice is that each of them have just one single bond between each of these double bonds, where these will not be conjugated because they have more than one single bond between those double bonds. And so when we are talking about conjugated systems, we're talking about alternating double and single bond systems. So you need at least two double bonds and they need to have only one single bond between them. And so one thing interesting about these is that they have quite a bit of extra stability. So if we just look at one pentene and we want to hydrogenate it, so H2 and platinum here, that will be exothermic, giving off negative 126 kilojoules. Then if we do an internal one, it's a little bit more stable, so only 116. If we have two of them here, then this is roughly the sum of two isolated double bonds. So the heat given off by this is roughly what you would expect from just two double bonds. Whereas when we have a conjugated system, this now goes down by quite a bit. So we went from negative 252 kilojoules to negative 225 kilojoules. So from adding, we would guess that this would be about negative 242 kilojoules because now we have an internal and a terminal double bond rather than two terminal double bonds. So remember our Zaitsev's rule, when we have more substituents on the double bond, it's more stable. And so if we have one of these internal, then that would bring down the energy a bit. And so we would expect this to be about negative 242, but in fact we get about 17 kilojoules of extra stability. And that means that we're closer in energy to the more stable alkane is essentially what we're talking about here. And if we have them right next to each other like this, so this is called a cumulated diene, then this is actually less stable. So now we're at negative 292 kilojoules where again we would expect it to be about negative 242. And so this table kind of shows this more pictorially. So again, our accumulated diene is more unstable. Then we have this terminal alkyne and this internal alkyne, which are higher in energy. Then our isolated diene right here is higher in energy. Then this isolated diene has an internal alkene. And then we have the conjugated down here, which is lower in energy than all of those. And so these conjugated systems have extra stability to them when compared to other unsaturated systems. And so the example molecule that we'll be using quite often is the 1,3-butadiene. So that's a four-carbon chain with two conjugated double bonds in it. And this is a planar molecule because there is a pi bond character in the central bond. So what we're talking about is essentially the molecule that looks like this, so it's four members in here, and then it has these double bonds right here. And what we're saying is that there is a partial double bond character between those two carbons along that single bond. So the central bond is shorter because it has more S character. These two carbons right here and here are both sp2 and because it has a partial double bond character as I just said. And so the electrons in the conjugated system are delocalized over the entire molecule. So that looks something like this. So we have our 1,3-butadiene right here and what we see is that these pi bonds which are these lobes above and below right here, has some small amount of overlap along this bond right here. And so we can actually get longer conjugated systems, and those will also have that overlap along those single bonds. 
And so that's what makes these conjugated systems behave quite differently than what you would expect from just having multiple double bonds. And so you might notice that this right here has the different colors for these lobes, and that is because those are in a different phase. And so what we're talking about here is if we have this as one of the lobes on here, and this is the other, and so this is for our p orbital here, we bring in the p orbital for the other atom right here, and when we combine those together, we can get constructive interference. Or if they are out of phase with each other, as shown down here, we get destructive interference, and so they just cancel each other out. And so what we're talking about here is if we bring in this p orbital and this p orbital and they are pointed at each other with the same phase here, then we get constructive interference and we end up with this orbital. Whereas if we bring in these two p orbitals here and we are approaching out of phase like this, then what we end up with is destructive interference. And so those will actually cancel each other out and we get what's called an anti-bonding orbital. And so for molecular orbital theory, what we see are diagrams that look like this. So we have our atomic orbitals here. So that's this one and this one. So those are the p orbitals from two different atoms. And so we bring those together and the constructive interference is lower in energy than the destructive interference. So the destructive interference causes this node where we see these are out of phase with each other. And so there will be no electron density in between right there. And so we actually get a node and that's called anti-bonding. And we denote that with a pi star here where the bonding is pi. And so what we are doing, we're bringing in the atomic orbitals here. So this is the electron from this one up here. And this is the electron from this one up here. And we're essentially bringing these in. And we have this come down here, this one come down here, and we form this double bond right here. And that double bond is formed from two electrons, one coming from each carbon. And so we end up with it like this. And our anti-bonding orbital up here is unfilled. And so this is a bonding molecular orbital because only the bonding molecular orbital down here is filled with electrons. And so that's what gives us the double bond between those two carbons right there. And then if we have a conjugated system, we're actually bringing in four electrons because we're forming two double bonds in our 1,3-butadiene. And so what we end up with is these two bonding orbitals. So this one right here and this one right here. And so we see that this one is all bonding. So everything is bonding right there, where this one has one anti-bonding part of it right there. So this node right there. And that's why the single bond between those two double bonds is only a partial double bond, because it's a mixture of those two states. And so it has some anti-bonding character, which makes it just a partial double bond for it. But then if we have these antibonding orbitals right here, these antibonding molecular orbitals, what we see is that these have nodes between those two right there. And so again, remember, we're talking about this molecule right here that has the double bond there and the double bond there. And so this node would be sort of right here, and this node would be right here. And so what we see is if we actually excite this, and we'll be talking about that more in future videos, so we hit it with a photon and it excites, we can actually cause those double bonds to break. And then, of course, this one up here is all anti-bonding. And so we would have to promote up to there in order to break all of these double bonds in this conjugated system. And so those are the molecular orbitals that we see for our 1,3-butadiene. And so this is the sort of diagram that you will usually see. So right here we have it for ethylene, which is just two carbons double bound together like this. We have this right here, which is our bonding molecular orbital. Up here we have our anti-bonding molecular orbital. And right here in the middle we have our non-bonding molecular orbital. And again, I will talk more about that in future videos. But that just means it's not bonding, but it's also not anti-bonding. And so that is the orbital where our lone pairs and our free radicals and things like that will actually end up. Then over here we have the 1,3-butadiene 
So we have our bonding molecular orbitals down here and our anti-bonding ones up here. And we see that all four of the electrons are going into these two bonding molecular orbitals right here when we have this in the unexcited state. And another important thing to notice is that the number of molecular orbitals that we have has to be equal to the number of atomic orbitals that we have. So we're bringing in four carbons, one, two, three, four. So each one is bringing in one electron. So we have four atomic orbitals. And so we must have four molecular orbitals right here. And so that will always be the case, that there should be the same number of molecular orbitals as there are atomic orbitals. Another thing to notice is that we denote the bonding molecular orbitals as pi 1, pi 2, and so those don't have the stars on it, where anti-bonding are the starred ones here. And yet another thing to notice is that every time we go up one energy level, we are adding a single node onto here. So we get one node, we go up to the next one, we have one and two nodes, we go up another one, we have one, two, and three nodes right there. So we always go up by one node every time we go up by an energy level. And because we have that partial double bond character between the C2 and C3 atoms in our 1,3-butadiene, this is why the molecule is planar. So we don't have these sticking off in different directions. This double bond right here and this double bond right here will be pointing in the same direction. So these conformations that we can take are called the S trans and the S cis, where the S stands for single because we're talking about essentially trans and cis around this single bond right here. So we have the S trans where we are trans around that single bond right there, and we have the S cis where we are cis around that single bond right there. And we see that the S cis is going to have this mild interference here because we have these groups right here and we could be even more substituted on there, but even with the hydrogens we get some mild interference. But when it's just the hydrogens there, the S trans conformation is more stable than the S cis conformation. But the rotational barrier is only about 20 kilojoules per mole compared to the 250 kilojoules per mole if that were a double bond around there. So if this bond right here were a double bond rather than a single bond, it would be an order of magnitude more energy to actually interconvert between these. And so because it's such a small amount of energy, these two conformations can easily interconvert at room temperature. But anyway, that was everything I wanted to talk about in this video. I hope you found this helpful, and I will see you in the next one.